Yes, sir. How are you? How are you? Fine? Yes, Lord. Yesterday you delivered a very good speech. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you know about it? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy to learn that uh, the delivery well received and created a good impression on us. It was very nice. Thank you. Right? Hello. How are you? Fine? Yes. Shall we start yes, sir, uh, today we have a small group, Brother Muzaffar Clark and uh, Clem Edward, you know both of them. Yes. And we have the guest uh, lady, Dr. Hesler from Dr. Bournemouth. Yes, sir. And they would like to ask some yes, questions, sir, please. Sir, please. Uh, please. Uh, there's a question from abroad. Uh, the question uh, refers to the uh, tradition that the, during Ramadan the gates of heaven are opened Open and the, the gates of hell are closed and the satans are changed. Does this refer to the people who are keeping the fast, or is it more universal? You see, this is uh, a hadith which I was going to take up during my next sermon, inshallah. Right. At length and in depth, I will try to explain everything about it. But uh, just a cursory study would not make anybody get to the get. I mean, understand anything from this, right. because. Uh, if the gates of hell are closed, to whom? And if the gates of heaven are open, to whom? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't mention believers or those who are keeping fast. So it is just uh, an expression, a sort of invitation to, uh, I mean, to warn people against committing sins and continuing to commit sins during a month which is sacred. Mm. And if you do that, if you do that, I mean, that's the message implied, then al although ordinarily sins are, of course, never approved by Allah, but during certain days, if you commit sins, you're held legally responsible. Mm. Things which one normally do, da, does, which have nothing of illeg illegality about them, become doubly illegal at certain times, like during the day of Sabbath. Mm. Things which okay previously, before the Sabbath was imposed, were forbidden, although normally in daily life they're not forbidden at all. So I think that is the general spirit of this hadith. Mm. So at times when somebody is, uh, now let's first think in human terms, because the terms which I'm going to use do not apply to God literally, of course. If you're in the presence of uh, a king who is sitting in audience before the people, then to misbehave is doubly punishable. And if at that time you make advances, uh, no, not make advances, but to you try some to uh, to pl present your case to him, which otherwise would be difficult for you to do because of the distances involved. Mm -hmm. If you are given a close audience and uh, you are able to present your case well, naturally one expects that case to be heard sooner than through other sources. Mm. So this is a scenario which we understand as human beings in relation to the people whom who we, we hold in awe or who are great or whatever they are. In relation to us, when we are given access, when we are close, that is the time for us to benefit as best as we possibly can. So these are the two uh, underlying messages Hmm. Because exactly like in human terms, it is said Allah comes closer to the earth. Yes. So that is why I am saying we better understand it in our own experience and our own terms. Otherwise, Allah is everywhere. So what is the meaning of His getting closer? Hmm. This means that uh, He is more in. Again, the word mood does not apply to Allah. He has no moods. 
but only to make you understand in human terms the Holy Prophet says that Allah comes closer to you and is ready to receive ready to respond so if you make a special effort during these, this month to get closer then you are far more likely to be heard than otherwise mm. and this is the meaning of the door of heaven mm. being wide open mm. otherwise uh, these parables and metaphors should not be taken too literally otherwise there won't be anything right thank you very much please Are there any extra um, needs which our patients will have during Ramadan which we as doctors should be aware of in terms of fasting? Or the patients? Yes. I can't know. What should be they aware of? Will they, will they be fasting and will that affect their care? You see, the patients, the Holy Quran very categorically says that the patients suffering the ill are exempt from fasting. Now, this is a very uh, difficult question to answer in generalization. That is why Allah has not uh, elaborated it in the Quran himself. Because suffering or being a patient varies from person to person. And his own capability to take suffering and to uh, respond to such situations as bodily ailments. Some people feel ill even at a slight indisposition. And they are built like that. Some can take even bigger ills usually, it's no problem. And uh, small ailments don't, don't bother them much. So it's the inner decision of the man himself. If he himself is convinced that he is ill and he can't keep the fast, so he must not fast at, in, in such a case. And he can exempt himself. No other authority, no outside authority can judge that. So those of the ulema who take it into their hands to decide whether somebody is ill or not, they play God which of the which they have no right. So if somebody makes false excuses and does not keep fast, what then? We are not to judge him. He will go to, to God to whom everybody else will return. So there's no problem involved whatsoever. But unfortunately in some parts of the Muslim society, uh, like in Northwest province, there is such rigidity in relation to the formal exercises of worship, etc., etc., that uh, the mullahs take it into their own hand to decide whether somebody is really uh, permitted really ill or not and if somebody for instance is suffering heavily he still would not be, would leave fast for the fear of the mullah's reaction so there it is a common experience there particularly during the summer heat that people pass out in public here and there and uh, as yet they are not given water <coughs> until the mullah takes a pinch of dust dry dust open his mouth and puts the dust in the mouth and then you know <coughs> takes spoons it out to see whether it was wet or not if it is wet you see he was just feigning he is not really <laughs> so, <laughs> So they must be very certain whether somebody is swaining or swooning. This is absurdity. This is really total annihilation of religious philosophy and religious values. So it's entirely up to anyone to decide for himself. Another question on fasting. As always, uh, um, a friend of mine asked, you know, if he's, he's thinking about going to uh, Antarctica to do some geological work, and mm -hmm. he's saying that, you know, oh, if I was a Muslim, which he's not, uh, you know, what would I do? Would I be would I be allocated times of sunrise and sunset to the nearest town, or how did I go about attributing times for fasting at the North and South Pole? Where well, this issue has already been explained by me repeatedly. In fact, because 
and not, not because, but this the, before the Ramadan, the la, during the last sermon, yeah, I spoke on this subject. Oh, in detail. you didn't see it. You see, if Islam is really a religion for the whole mankind, and if Islam is really the religion for all times to come until the doomsday, then such questions must have been uh, answered by Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu if not in so many words by the Quran. Because uh, the Quran is a book of principles and uh, it speaks in principle of, ev of everything, but it can't discuss everything in detail. So where the details are left out, there Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, guided by additional wahi, additional revelation as to what is meant by the Quran on that in that regard, in that regard. So many times he explained things which otherwise would have always remained a moot, moot, uh, or moot questions for us, like this one. Once Allah told him through Jabril that uh, during the days of the Jal, the Antichrist, the days will be not equal on the entire surface of the earth. They will differ. Some days, and most of them, would be the normal days of 24 hours. The others would vary up to a day of full one year. Everybody was amazed because at, as, as yet the concept of how the earth is rounded and what happens to the, in the in, close to the pole or at the pole, they were unknown things by the society at that time. So. The first question which arose was about the worship, uh, about the prayers and fastings, etc. So one of the present inquired from Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah if the day is lengthened to full one year, shall we be saying five prayers during the whole day or should it be different? The answer was, of course not. You should judge your days according to the normal days you know. And measure your days, divide them into normal days. That is again 360 days per year. 365. 30, according to Islamic calendar, 355, not 60, 360. Yes. Because uh, they were 10 years, Islamic calendar was 10 days shorter. So I reduced, but not correctly. It, I should have said 350 uh, days, 355 days, because I'm talking in, in you know in relation to the time when Hazrat Muhammad was instructing him, and there they knew the calendar by the lunar calendar, not the lunar, but the uh, so, no, lunar calendar, not the solar calendar. Anyway, it's small, it's small thing. What he said was the year should be divided into. 24 hour day sections and each sec section should be attended according to the Islamic instructions. Now this automatically resolves so many other questions about the fasting, about the prayers. Now if you have to divide the day into five prayers, time prayers, then according to the normal days, you, for a, you have to fix at let's say, not fix, but carve out a portion of the 24 hour day into a day time and the second into the night time. This also brings to light the question of what he meant by one year day. When he say, said a day would be as long as full one year, what he meant was including the night and the day because he was talking of 24 hours a day right right i see so that means 6 year 6 months night and 6 months day according to uh, the, the the relations of day and night to the appearance or disappearance of sun 
So this is exactly what happens at at the point of North Pole. So also it happens at the point of South Pole. There, six months night and six months day follow each other. So, and in between, as he has explained, the days would vary. So as you close, go close to the North or South Pole. Mm. But at, at the North and South Pole, Yes. And they so they carved out this time and said, right, this is when we're going to do morning prayers and evening prayers, and that sets our time. Approaching the pole, when you do have the sun, you know, like say 500, 600 miles away, there will be a time when it will be a tremendously hard long day. day. Also, is a subject which I discussed during my sermon. Finally, <laughs> I'll send him the tape. I it's, think. it's a very, very interesting answer which Anzaru Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave because it relates to the signs by which normal days are made to disappear. This is the basic message. Right. When those signs by which we make the normal days disappear, then the, the right of people there to judge, the, to, de to decide, I mean not decide, but to divide the 24 hours into day days and nights, begins to operate. Now, in case you are approaching the North Pole, although the day may still be 24 hours day, but according to the Quranic signs, they will not be applicable in, uh, during, say, you know, between many uh, a latitude situated in a certain, clo in certain closeness to the North Pole. For instance, if the night is reduced to four hours, the dawn would lengthen so much, yeah. so also the dusk, that they would join each other. And I have seen it myself. Yeah. When we went to the North Pole, no, not North Pole, but uh, North Cape in Norway, we experienced all these various, you know, changing pattern of days and nights. What happened was, at times we, we found that although the sun, sun set and sun rose, yet there is no separating line between the evening dusk and the morning dawn. And the Holy Quran, speaking of our uh, uh, fasting as well as speaking of the prayers, describes the time with relation to the sun and the dusk and the, uh, the position of sun and after what, happen, what happens after the sun is set, right? So when the conditions disappear, what to do? Yeah. then you are given the right, right to judge for yourself. So the secret lies in the, in his, his word, normal days. Right. What he said was, judge according to the normal days. In normal days, the signs of the Quran are applicable. And when they are no longer applicable, then they begin the period, they begins the period of abnormal days. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please. Well, uh, it's a subject that you've discussed previously. It's about black holes. That's right. Um, I know there's a lot of... Um, controversy about the exact nature of them, but we know that black holes absorb light. But every, as everything has a negative and a positive image, uh, if, are there, could there be such things as white holes which emanate light in the same way as black holes absorb light? This is the white hole in which we are breathing and living, because the sun is radiating light. <laughs> See, but what you are talking about perhaps is something else. And that is something which creates a very intriguing possibility. If the black hole absorbs matter as such, there is matter and antimatter. Mm. And some scientists believe that the ma this mass of matter is exactly the same as the mass of antimatter. 
as long as they are kept apart at safe distances, they remain, Separate. you know, in existence. When they are brought together, they disappear into nothingness. So this is what may have happened in the in the in the what may ultimately happen in the black hole. Black hole. I'm sorry. The black hole cannot attract masses from such long distances as hundreds of thousands of years of light. Uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of years, light years. Yet it does. When it grows extremely powerful, it engulfs, it swallows everything. Even at meteoric distances, like many million years away, that is how ultimately the uh, the black hole, which would appear at the end of the time, will have everything swallowed and dissolved into it. That can only happen if its gravitational pull is out of proportion bigger and uh, more powerful than the planets around. The bigger it grows, the more it eats, the more gigantic it becomes. So a dwarfish giant is born out of the black hole which begins his journey from by, by eating and consuming the things around at short distances. Mm -hmm. Then as it grows larger and smaller, larger in strength and smaller in size, it seizes upon itself. It's, it plays upon even such distant stars to which it cannot reach before. So that is how the vacuum around is, bigger and bigger vacuum is created. And uh, anything which just passes through is immediately pulled back, pulled into it. Now this can happen if there is enough mass within the black hole, whether we see it or not. Because without mass, it could not attract anything. Now the question which I, uh, arises and which I am pointing out is that if it also absorbs antimatter, then the moment it begins to absorb, the matter within should be negated and equated so completely that uh, it should disappear. Right. You see? It loses its power as That's well. right. Okay. So the black hole should s begin to melt away the moment it begins to suck the antimatter as well. And ultimately what we knew as universe would be an equation of zero is equal to zero. No more. And that is another very important issue which has to be discussed and scientists are taking it up as to whether creation can be made out of nothing, out of nothingness. Now my concept of creation is that the secret lies in the poles, in the opposite number. And some scientists have already succeeded in creating uh, some, some subatomic, extremely minute particles which have no mass, out of nothing just by creating poles. No mass. No mass. Mm. The poles are created and with the pole they come into being. Mm. The only way you can see them is by electric charge. Isn't it? It? Well, electric charge is a very, very crude term to, 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 to be applied mm. to that. It, I'm talking of such minute things mm. which can only be re reached through mathematics not through any electronic or other means. You work it out mathematically and you know that it must have happened, it has happened. Otherwise it's impossible. So what I'm talking about is that about black hole there's some very intriguing possibilities which are developing and are being discussed by the scientists. One is this, 
not this, but the others, this is mine. That maybe now we understand the process of creation. The will of God creates two ends. And the sum total of the two ends remains zero. See? <laughs> it has both show physical forms of existence. But they are just the will of God manifested in a way that they form, take the physical form while the zero remains zero. Outside God there is nothing but zero. So you bring them together, fuse them together and they vanish. So similarly, maybe either the black hole itself begins to dissolve and diminute gradually, become smaller and smaller gradually by absorbing antimatter as well. Or maybe there are two types of black holes, some made of antimatter and some of matter. And they are kept at a distance. And uh, if God desires to bring everything to the knot, absolute knot, then they, they may be they are permitted to come back, uh, to, to fuse together. But the other interesting possibilities which are really being discussed through uh, the imagination of more dimensions. We know three di dimensions or four dimensions, but scientists are mathematically producing the possibilities, logical possibilities of creating more dimensions, even they have worked up to 14 dimensions. It's absolutely mind-boggling to conceive that 14 dimension thing. But with mathematics no problem, you know, on the right, on the right paper and with the pencil you can do things. <laughs> <laughs> so, if they, now the point which I want to, to raise is, is specifically this. Some mathematicians who worked on these possibilities, they believe that it is just possible that the black hole is just really a hole to a new world, opening into a new sort of universe with different dimensions. So they sink here and rise there, like the sun sets here and rises at another place. So there is no nothingness according to them. It's only a change of form or dimensions. So this universe which sinks here disappears in a new form, in new dimensions, in the same space, not in a different space. But the whole is, is so complicated for ordinary mind to imagine that one can't conceive how can it happen that in the same space it sinks and reappears, but they point out that change the dimension that things disappear to you. A parallel universe. A parallel universe in the same place. Mm. What we know as space mm. or time space. Exactly in the same time space with new dimensions a new creation is made. So one finishes and the other appears. This is only the scientific game. You know they enjoy it the mathematical games and this and that. The Holy Quran is very specific on this. It does not support this view. The Holy Quran says that when Allah wills, Allah brings the matter close like wrapping up a sheet of paper round one's hand. And everything, the whole universe will be wrapped up around Allah's hand. The words hand, hands are used, but uh, you know the meaning is, of course, not the hand like mine. So everything is wrapped up and disappears. Like we created for the, uh, and this is a process, God says, which would be repeated again and again like we created the universe for the first time, we, we, we shall recreate it 
after bringing it to nothingness. And the manner in which, the, the, or manner or the way it is brought to nothingness is exactly the picture of black hole in formation. Uh, this is the most intriguing part. One is amazed at the Quranic description. The like of it is not found in any other divine work. Impossible. Search far and wide. These are the statements which stand out in, in their uniqueness. And the reason is that this was the book which had to remain operative till the end of the time. So all that man had discovered or man had developed enough to perceive had to be somehow mentioned in the Quran, otherwise people would say it's a book of the past. So this is the issue which we are, I am discussing which proves that the Holy Quran is not a book of the past. It is still valid and will continue to remain valid because the other thing, the references which I can't understand as present and I know they have to be understood later on by the man of the future. So this is one of the things which we do understand now. The Holy Quran says that a time would come when matfiyatum bi yaminahi the whole universe would be wound round on the right hand. Then he says that we will uh, pack it up like the scribes of the old used to pack up all they had written on him, all their scrolls and finish them. Then it says that the universe, the Holy Quran says at another place, the universe was shut like a ball. Nothing escaped it. Kanata Ratkan. The heavens and the earth were just one small packed up ball which as if was sewn around in a manner that nothing could escape from it. And then it says, فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا We rent them asunder and created both heaven and earth by that act of breaking it open. Now, show me anywhere in the world where any philosopher or any religious book had mentioned such a thing. Now, this is exactly the Big Bang description which we read in, 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 the, in the scientific books, and the phys in physics in particular. Uh, what, what branch of physics is that called? Which Particle which? physics? Huh? Particle physics? No, no. Oh. This black hole and geophysics? No. No, 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 no. no, no. Astrophysics. Astro Astrophysics. Astrophysics. Maybe, uh, yes, that's right. So they c the p image of black hole which we have learned from them is exactly that it, it shuts everything, <coughs> closes everything, nothing can escape. Then God would break it open is the verdict of the Quran. And then another verdict is that everything was like, uh, a, like smoke. And then we condensed it, and out of that smoke were born the heavens and the earth. Now this is the second phase after the Big Bang. Yeah. You see, the gaseous state which appears, which follows the Big Bang, is also described by the Quran. So that was the last verse which I quoted first. How will it come to an end again? Now, according to the scientists, when the accretion from the, uh, from the space around begins to fall or being pulled by the gravitational, immense gravitational pull of the black hole, it begins to approach the speed of light. And because no matter can reach the speed of light, or uh, if it becomes closer, cannot retain its form as it, it has. So grotesque things begin to happen. And according to the scientists, as it gets closer, 
it becomes pressed into a sheet. Imagine the Quranic description and the description of the scientist, what happens as the matter approaches the black hole. And they say it gets compressed into sheet-like things. And because the black hole is revolving, so as it disappears into the black hole, before that it gets wrapped round. That's all we know. <laughs> what happens later on, nobody knows. Now this description is, of the Quran is so precise, so precisely applicable to what the scientists have discovered, that if there is no other proof of the existence of God, this should be enough. Unbelie unthinkable for a man of that age, however educated he might have been, to think in, the term, in these terms of the universe, the beginning and the ending and so on and so forth. Well, the prophet who told us these things was one of the illiterate, according to the Quran. While the sum total of the whole educated world, uh, uh, mankind of that period, could not have conceived together this thing. It's impossible. Yet a man from the desert of Arabia gets up and says, I am being told by God this and that and that. And he himself perhaps cannot fully, com fully comprehend. Allah knows best, but he knows this is the word of God. And strange it is that nobody raised questions and eyebrows as to what this may meant. They thought maybe it would happen one day like like this thing, the resurrection would take place, but not but before the resurrection, doomsday would, would take place. But how could they interpret these verses together in relation to each other? Because the concept of the people at the time of Hazrat Muhammad was that once the doomsday occurs, then we go to another world. And that world is indestructible. It never repeats itself. And according to the Holy Quran, this is the image. This is the clear picture given. But what? The, why did they not wonder as to what the Quran was saying here? It said, we go on destroying and repeating, destroying and repeating. So obviously, this applied to the physical existence of the universe the Holy Quran was talking about because uh, hereafter is a different thing. According, according to the Holy Quran, we can't even imagine what forms and what shapes will take or will, will be given to us after we open up our eyes in the new world. So they are two different things. But Allah let, did not permit them to even think of such objections against this statement because this statement is so enlightening today, but was so objectionable at the time of its revelation. So this is also a miracle that nobody thought of it, nobody understood, nobody said, all right, things beyond us, let's forget about it. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please. Euthanasia is becoming a very important discussion for debate That's nowadays. Right. Um, do you think there's ever any justification for euthanasia? <coughs> You see, according to the Holy Quran, life is not our possession. We do not own life. Mm -hmm. And the sanctity of life is so important that temporary stray suffering must not be permitted to interfere with the inviolable principle of sanctity of life. life, life. So, if once you begin to give right to people to take either their own life on the excuse that they are suffering or to take somebody else's life mm -hmm. because that person is suffering and says, all right, you can take my life. Once it begins, there will be no end to it. Then other things will follow. And all the sanctity of the life we fully, strictly imposed here in our laws, man-made laws as well, will go overboard. It will be, you know, result in chaos. The question is, suffering can be relieved to a degree by man 
through drugs and other things. If you can't relieve a person beyond that, then suffering is a means of bringing death. Now, let God do it by His law. A few moments more and, or a few moments less, less do not matter as compared to the price you have to pay once you begin to take these things into your own hands. So, if the suffering increases, that suffering also causes unconsciousness. Because the threshold of different people is different, so in some cases it doesn't happen as, so quickly as you expect or uh, doesn't happen so as quickly as in some other piece of people's cases. So this is ag again another dilemma, the problem we face doesn't seem to have any solution because people's threshold of suffering uh, or tolerance of suffering changes. Some people at the slightest pain, you know, they kick a shindy about and say, raise the whole, you know, pardon? Raise the roof. A roof, yes, right. Raise the roof. Or, you know, in Urdu we say they, uh, to raise the, uh, the heavens. So <laughs> we didn't have roofs. I, I was doing unless I was between the two. That's why I hesitated. And uh, at least they kick a shindy, if nothing else, if not the roof. While some suffer so patiently to such a degree that it's unbelievable. Only when you go through that experience yourself, then you know how the disease was was uh, punishing. So it all depends. Now, whom will you permit at what level? How would you know? The inside story. How can you project yourself into the mind of a person and judge really this is be gone, this has gone beyond the normal level of suffering. So we shouldn't interfere in these things. Also, maybe some people suffer as a result of, you know, this is God punishing them maybe. I mean, sometimes suffering is not ah, meant to be pain. You, you mean those who watch them, they suffer? Well, uh, is it, yeah, maybe... maybe is it to relieve themselves that they kill the others? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> what I mean is that there's an other angle to it as well. Sure, yeah. A mother suffers for the suffering of the child. A, a son suffers for the suffering of his mother, for instance, or a daughter for the mother, suffering of his father. So maybe the attitude is selfish. They want to put the suffering person at rest to have some rest themselves. And these things have happened in real life and they have been recorded in the history of legal battles where some lawyers tried to defend such people because they thought it was done out of mercy for them. But the fact is, it could be the other way around. It could be out of mercy for themselves, you know. <laughs> they wanted to get rid of this nuisance. Yeah. So things become further complicated when, when you start to look at it from the different, from the other angle as well. And, uh, there's a gentleman at work, mm -hmm. and uh, his mother basically had died, but was still there was a brain form, yeah. so that, that you know for them they couldn't ha they couldn't bury their mother because she wasn't she f still uh, passed uh, one of the six uh, but criteria. But this is the same question. Her question was, uh, no, was different. This yes. is my question. This is your question. Yes, I, I know that, but there. But decisions I have been giving, because I have been repeatedly asked by Ahmadis for advice in such cases, I tell them that what you call clinical death is a terminology of science. And what you call mental death is also another term of science. Now, when you inquire from these people, the doctors who know, when you say the brain is dead, what would happen if you take the machines off or remove the patients from under the machines? They would tell you that it is likely, more likely that he would die. But sometimes he continues to live a vegetable life. 
which is not really the life as we know it. Because he can't think, he can't sense, he can't suffer, he can't have any joy, any happiness. So he's practically dead. Now, in view of these two different situations, I tell them that if the machine is removed and the patient lives, then you have no right to kill it. Right. On, on the excuse that it's just a vegetative life. Allah knows best, we don't know. But life, whether vegetative or uh, b uh, zoological, still has its sanctity and you not permitted to touch. But maybe the suffering of those who live and who are close to the, per to the person is caused by them themselves, by the wrong system. Mm -hmm. Why in the first place was this patient's life dragged out while under normal situation he could not survive? So when you become over much fussy, then these things happen. Right. In England here, in London, there was an Ahmadi who, whose wife suffered from some stroke and the, bra the brain ceased to function. Now my normal, ad my ordinary advice is to give them some homeopathy or other drugs from any system of cure which claim that uh, something can happen. But don't put such patients on machine because that would be dragging them out that would not be doing, doing them any good whatsoever. Even if they survive, they survive with some deficiencies, some uh, permanent damages. Some cannot speak, some cannot see, some cannot move themselves. They can't eat anything. You have to, you have to do everything mechanically for them on their behalf. Somebody else should live on their behalf and do the functions which the patient normally does himself. So this is the complication, so I tell Ahmadis to behave, mm. to know where to submit. Yeah. See, this is the decision. Shall we submit to the will of Allah here and take only the normal measures to save the patient, not beyond? But some out of senti sentiments, etc., they say, all right, and they, they're also overawed by the new system, new machine and things. And they say, doctors say, let's, we, let's put, put, put the patient the, under the machine. Okay. They do it. And after keeping the patient alive for a month or so, because of the extra expenditure involved, because of the shortage, of the availability of such machines and so on, they begin to advise you then. We think enough is enough, you know. <laughs> you better <laughs> book your patient. <coughs> So the life of death, life or death is decided by the doctors without any rhyme or reason. Why? So what the worst part of this is, in one case I, I had been insisting, please remove the machine because it's too long and I think it's not fair to the patient herself. And when they removed, she still continued to live. This automatic. You know, breathing apparatus was working and there was no other sign of life. Whenever the, the brain was charted, you know, they said, dead straight line, no? Yeah. No ups and downs. So, man is creating is suffering for himself. The principle involved is do not try to fight with the decree of Allah. You will never be able to defeat it. <laughs> right? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Please, Ms. Offer. Oh, no. I'm I'm, well, <coughs> do you have another question? Yes. yes, I'd like to know whether that extends to um, uh, now it's at Lon London hospitals. They're operating on babies before they've been born to correct yes, defects in order to enable them to survive. Right. Right. Does that extend to um, operating on, on these children before birth? Do you feel? that that's interfering as you well? You see, operation before birth is, uh, I, I don't think we have, 
we can have any religious objection or moral objections against that because uh, the principle by which I am always guided is are you helping the plan of God, you are moving in the direction of the plan of things or you are opposing it, moving in the opposite direction. So, for instance, if a genetical engineering is employed to improve the quality of the life God has created, it will, should not be religiously objectionable because you are moving along the winds, along the plan of things. If you try to create new animals out of the created animals and distort their images for gaining some purposes you think would be useful for humanity, that will be going against the grain because he is the creator, he has created balances and we do not in fact realize the, the importance of even the smallest thing that lives in the ecosystem that we know. Every, everything plays its role and man has repeatedly discovered, unfortunately too late for him, that whenever an attempt was made to change the environments and the ecosystem, uh, would you say eco or ecosystem? Eco, I think. Doesn't matter. That's fine. Echo is different, you know. Echo is the reverberation of the sound you hear. You know, mm -hmm. When it, it's, it strikes against something, it returns to you. But ecosystem, I think it is, isn't it? That's right, yeah. That's right. So, in, in Australia, some experience, experiments were carried out, not experiments, but some attempts were made so to get rid of certain animals. Mm. And as they got rid of those animals, the they had to go through a, a chain or a procession of problems born one out of the other. And they could not bring under control the things which were unleashed and, you know, and, and they released suddenly out completely beyond their imagination. If certain, for instance, uh, um, rabbits were destroyed, the rabbits fed on certain bushes and grasses, etc. On the same bushes and grasses, some extremely dangerous insects also fed. Now, because the rabbits consumed most of the bushes and the grasses, so the population of those dangerous or uh, insects, etc., was automatically controlled and some other animals also were uh, kept within their confinement created or imposed by nature. Now you do away with one important factor in the environment and the, the, you sort of uh, open a Pandora's box of problems. You know, chain of, uh, link after link, chains develop which are very difficult to Reverse. brought under your control once again. Mm. So that is what has happened in Australia and that also has happened in England mm. sometimes. So that is why the scientists are very, very careful nowadays. There is a fly which causes uh, impetigo and other rashes which are very painful and you find this fly by the rivers in many lovely areas where the tourists go so often. So to bring it to bring it under control was the main problem with the scientists here in England. Now they invented something or discovered a bacteria which could uh, cause fatal diseases in that uh, in the larvae of these flies. But having learned their lessons, they were extremely careful. In, in, in small controlled areas, they experimented with, with these new bacteria and they washed every other species of life present in that water. 
what effect it causes upon them and did not release this into the nature until they were according to them 100% certain that it could only create benefit in helping nature not to work against it. So there's so many things, you know, which, which one has to bring into focus of attention, particularly playing with nature is very, very dangerous. In America now there are many lawsuits against some states who have permitted uh, genetical engineering to uh, attempt to create certain insects which they feel would be beneficial for man because the those who have sued the, the, the state are also knowledgeable scientists belonging to this field. They say, and they, they r uh, rightly so I believe, that according to certain experiments what we projected did not result in the same thing. The experiment did not re result in the same thing which we had projected. This is what I want to say. For instance, they cut off a gene from, mm, uh, from I think it was a mouse or something anyway, some animal, small animal, and planted that gene upon an insect to change its characters so that instead of being uh, harmful, it would become a useful animal. Now, what they, when they were horrified to, to, to de detect that according to the mathematical calculations, what should have resulted did not result a new thing was born, as if, you know, through mutation if something had suddenly appeared <coughs> which they had not uh, calculated upon. They were not expecting, I mean. So this is, they say, this is a very dangerous game. A gene within a set of genes, at, you know, placed in a certain position in a cr chromosome, may behave in a certain manner because it's also its effects are also inhibited or influenced by the genes around. So in a certain setup it works. How can you be sure that when planted upon an other chromosome in a certain order, because order is also, as you know, very important. Mm -hmm. the, if the order is changed, the life can completely be, uh, come to a halt because the chromosomes then would not live and cannot function if you change the orders improperly. They are sequenced by nature, by God as we believe. So the question arises as to whether these genes had a permanent quality, an individual confined quality, which could they could carry along with them wherever planted. Or will the genes should, uh, or should the genes to be taken as uh, possessing certain qualities in a given circumstances, in a given environment. Now this incident which I have just quoted proves the fact, as I also b have always held this, that genes should not be taken to me to have totally independent characters. Their qualities, their characters are defined in that given situation of the cell in which they are attached and placed in a certain order along a, line, a, a thread of chromosome and if you remove it maybe something else develops and it has developed and this is why this is one scientific line of future in relation to the time of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu which has been roundly condemned by the Holy Quran. Holy Quran speaks of so many prophecies of scientific achievements of man and new creations and this, this and that and never you find any reflection upon that. It is recommended, sort of, if not recommended, it is just plain statement, neutral statement that that and that is going to happen in the future. When you come to this, 
the Holy Quran says Satan would coax them on to do this and they would be punished. So when the creation of God is changed, the alarm bell, the bell begins to ring. You have gone perhaps too far, stepped out of your, your boundaries. So this is, uh, I think, in answer to your question, this should satisfy, is it right? I have one last question if we have time. Do we or? Uh, one minute, please continue. Right. The question I've got is that um, the America and CIA and all these uh -huh. agencies, they've always had like a, a budget to go and cause problems in Chile or problems in, this, in the world. Everywhere. They go and get the big wooden spoon out and stir uh -huh. it up. Right. Do we as a Jamaat have, you know, we, as we inshallah become more and more successful, yes. do we have anything to worry about these agencies coming in and stirring trouble in with as us? As long as they do not cross your, cross your path, let them do whatever they are. Let them waste their own money on. Because we don't have enough money to waste on them. <laughs> Pursuing them, for that you need billions of dollars. So let, let them function as they please. Only by way of advice, we must keep such people, such big powers warned. And well warned in advance that you're, uh, you know, you're playing with the peace of the rest of the world in the name of intelligence is, is not proper, it is not moral, it is not permitted to you, it not, the right is not granted to you by God. So don't play God. If you go on playing with the peace of others in the name of your interests, yeah. you see this is it. Oh, it's yeah. Uh, and where you judge yourself as to which lines to cross and which not to which later on when discovered, your own people condemn as wrong. What sort of game is it that you're playing? I have read books of the people involved with CIA at very highest level, written by them. And uh, the secrets they unfold, uh, they reveal, is horrifying. You know? Because they're living a life of hypocrisy. Man as a whole is living a life of hypocrisy. The same thing is good judging by one yardstick and is bad judging by the another yardstick. And there are hundreds of thousands of yardsticks nowadays, <laughs> unfortunately. Right? Yes. The time flies past yes. like this, you know. <laughs> Unbelievable. During yes. my one hour of yes. question and answers, every time I found this, as we begin to warm up, uh, the time is, is over. Yeah? Maybe the time will come when one hour will become like one day, you know? <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll have six months. I hope break. not. <laughs> <laughs> not with my sessions, please. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm so comfortable with this plan of things because for me the days are flying past, you know, but when I have no work even for a few minutes, Time seems to suspend, you know, along yeah. with me. <laughs> it's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> so I consider myself very fortunate. Masha. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I try to keep others busy around me. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Sound like one. MTA International, reaching the corners of the earth.